Welcome, welcome. It's a very chilly, uh, very gray, wintry day in Amherst, Massachusetts here on the very first day of December, the birthday month of our favorite poet, Emily Dickinson. Uh, we're glad to be here with you. This, uh, my name is Brooke Steinhauser. I'm the program director at the Emily Dickinson Museum. Um, so glad you could join us for The Real Emily Dickinson at 191, a talk by the Emily Dickinson Museum's executive director, Jane Wald, in celebration of the poet's upcoming birthday and held in conjunction with our dear friends at the Amherst College Center for Humanistic Inquiry. So before I introduce the director of the center, I have just a few housekeeping matters. As always, we really appreciate the opportunity to connect with you virtually, and we hope you'll consider putting your comments in the chat so that we can hear from you and, and connect with you that way. Um, a great way to, to start that is uh, right this very minute. You can chime in, tell us where you're tuning in from today, uh, this evening or afternoon or morning, wherever you may be. We know we have um, a really great audience today. So we will have time at the end of this program for questions, which we will source from the typed Q&A function. So you might take a moment to locate that button now in your Zoom toolbar. You may enter questions. You can also upvote other people's questions there. Um, and you can do that at any point during the talk uh, so that when we arrive at our time for questions afterwards, um, all of your great inquiries will already be there waiting for us. Oh, hello. We have some Amherst folks with us, which is always so nice. We have someone from Spain, someone from Mexico. We've got Brazil. We have lots of folks from all over these United States. So great to, have, to see you all. Thank you so much for, for chiming in, tuning in today. Hello, Spain. <laughs> So, um, and my last note for you is just that we will be using Zoom's auto transcription feature this evening. So you can choose to turn this feature on or off using the live transcript button on your Zoom toolbar. Also should be found at the bottom of your, of your window. Uh, these captions are auto-generated, so we do apologize for any errors in transcription. So uh, without further ado, I'm delighted to introduce our colleague, Daryl Harper. He's the director of the Center for Humanistic Inquiry at Amherst College just over, uh, across the street from the Emily Dickinson Museum, where he oversees operations and programs in support of collaborative research projects in partnership with departments across the Amherst College campus. Daryl, thank you so much for partnering with the museum on this program. Thank you, Brooke. Um, I'm really happy to be here and uh, happy to be doing this uh, this program with you. It's um, uh, really a tradition uh, between our two organizations to uh, observe uh, Emily Dickinson's birthday in some fashion or another. Sometimes we've been in person and had uh, some really interesting cakes, sheet cakes with all kinds of designs on them. Uh, uh, there's been poetry recitation. Uh, last year we were celebrating the release of uh, Martin Werner's uh, wonderful book with Amherst College Press. Um, so uh, this occasion is actually the first time, uh, Jane, that I'm getting to hear you you give a lecture. Uh, so <laughs> really looking forward to that. Um, we work together all the time, but I haven't heard you do this before. Um, I want to let everyone know that the, the Center for Humanistic Inquiry, or as we affectionately call it, the CHI, is... Uh, uh, resources for Amherst faculty, staff, and students to engage in a broad vision of the role that humanistic thinking can play in scholarly life and in public, public life. Each year we invite uh, scholars, uh, several scholars, into residence under the rubric of a resonant theme. Um, we also do programs like this. We do performances, forums, uh, exhibits, uh, digital interventions, uh, and I hope uh, those of you who don't uh, know us already will uh, will uh, jump onto our mailing list or or follow along uh, on our website. You can find us at amherst.edu slash go slash chi and um, uh, see what we're up to. Our salon program uh, begins again in February with um, uh, a program called a winter's ramble. 
And this is a new song cycle by our colleague, Eric Sawyer in the music department. Um, and they'll be performing uh, live at the cheese. So I hope some of you can join us for that. So uh, now it's my pleasure to, uh, to introduce Jane Wald. Uh, Jane is the executive director of the Emily Dickinson Museum and has worked at the Homestead and the Evergreen since 2001. Uh, her work at the museum has included operational integration of the Homestead and the Evergreens. It has included expansion of the museum's program and its audiences and completion of numerous restoration and capital projects with a background in archives, archeology span and documentary editing. Uh, Jane's interests have tended toward the material and cultural context of Dickinson's environment and publications in this vein include, among others, pretty much real life, the material world of the Dickinson family for the Blackwell Companion to Emily Dickinson, and a short biography of the Homestead and the Evergreens and the forthcoming Oxford Handbook of Emily Dickinson. And that publication is actually edited by our colleague in English, uh, Karen Sanchez Epler. Uh, so welcome, Jane. Thank you. Thanks so much, Daryl. It's a real uh, pleasure to be here with you on the same screen with you. As you said, we do work together all the time. And um, uh, I'm sorry we can't be together in person for our traditional uh, Emily Dickinson celebration. But let's go ahead with um, uh, marking her 191st birthday. Um, so I'll, I have a few things to say, and then I'm going to try the always challenging uh, job of throwing myself into PowerPoint. But um, just to begin, uh, you know, during her lifetime, Emily Dickinson remained solidly and agreeably planted in Amherst, a known but somewhat withdrawn member of one of the town's leading families. And now at her 191st birthday, Dickinson's poetry still speaks uh, just so powerfully to readers all over the world. But her life seems just as, or perhaps even more contested in the popular imagination than ever. So this brings to mind uh, for me several questions. Can we know the real, the quote, real Emily Dickinson? Would we even want to? Would she want us to really know her? Uh, she didn't make it easy for us for later generations, what with her tendency toward social withdrawal and her reluctance to publish her work during her lifetime. Uh, her attitude, we sometimes think, can be summarized in a letter she wrote to her literary friend, Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Biography first convinces us of the fleeing of the biographied. So this afternoon, <clears throat> I'm gonna talk in a very limited way about some aspects of her life. <clears throat> but then uh, I'd like to spend most of the time telling, uh, telling a birthday story uh, about Emily Dickinson, the quote, the real Emily Dickinson, which is not my phrase and you'll, you'll, find, out, um, you'll find out why. Uh, this story will then tie in with how Dickinson is faring in popular culture today uh, and if there's time, I'll finish with a little show and tell about our current restoration work uh, at Emily Dickinson's homestead. So here, let me begin to share the screen and hope that this will work. Okay. So Brooke, could you please just confirm that we're seeing a, a slide? We are seeing uh, your presenter view, Jane, I think. Okay. There we Back. go, perfect. Okay, thank you, okay. Um, so many of you, I'm sure, are, are familiar with Emily Dickinson, but just a few basics. Um, Emily Dickinson was born on December 10th, uh, 1830, at her family's homestead on Main Street in Amherst, then uh, at that time occupied by a, a, a large family, her parents, her brother Austin, her grandparents, and several aunts and uncles. So it was a full house. Because of her grandfather's financial difficulties, the family lost the house and moved about a 
quarter mile away to a house next to West Cemetery in the center of town. Emily was uh, close to her uh, older brother Austin in interests and temperament and close to her younger sister Lavinia, even though their personalities were rather different. Dickinson's formal schooling was, was really exceptional for girls in the early 19th century, though not as unusual for girls in Amherst or in New England. After a short time at uh, an Amherst district school, she attended the co-educational Amherst Academy. So co-education was uh, uh, something new at the time uh, for a good classical education. And then uh, Mount Holyoke Female Seminary for one year in 1847. Um, in her youth, uh, Dickinson met and grappled with um, a variety of social, cultural, and personal pressures, which certainly helped to shape her poetic voice, the themes of her poetry, and in even the originality of her work. For example, a wave of religious revivals triggered a crisis of faith, or more accurately, a crisis of conscience uh, about the formalism of Calvinist doctrine. She encountered these religious pressures also at Mount Holyoke, which was probably one of the reasons she stayed there only for one year. Emily was happy for friends and family members who made their own expected public confessions of faith, but she declined doing so herself, saying, I am one of the lingering bad ones. Dickinson's letters to her brother also reveal a growing sense of personal, individual and familial difference uh, between herself and others. She wrote, what makes a few of us so different from others? It's a question I often ask myself. This sense of distinction became more pronounced as she grew older. So the family having left the homestead when she was about 10 years old, um, they returned to their family homestead in 1855. Her father uh, had purchased the home in early 1855 and made significant renovations to it, which we are still grappling with today, including adding a conservatory where Emily could raise climate sensitive plants and indulge her beloved hobby of gardening year round. So it was here at the homestead that almost all of Dickinson's known poetry was written. Shortly after the family returned to the homestead, uh, Dickinson's older brother, Austin, married her close friend, Susan Gilbert, uh, Susan Gilbert and they moved into a new home uh, next door built by their father, Edward Dickinson, which became known as the Evergreens. So this house uh, quickly became a hub of Amherst's so social, cultural, and civic life, and Dickinson herself took part in social gatherings there, uh, at least in the early years of Austin and Susan's marriage. So these two houses, the Homestead and the Evergreens, standing side by side, uh, were prominent fixtures in what was then still uh, partly agricultural and partly educational community. So in Dickinson's early 20s, writing became increasingly important to her. We don't really know the extent of Emily's early poems because a uh, few were saved or there is little uh, of, uh, few documents from that period of her life still exist, uh, po uh, poetry. However, one of her playful letters in poem form appeared anonymously in an Amherst College student publication when she was 19. This, is, um, this was printed in the Amherst Indicator. Uh, Emily Dickinson really came into her own as an artist during a short but intense period of creativity that resulted in her composing and revising and saving hundreds of poems. That period between 1858 and 1865 overlapped with uh, what was certainly the most significant event of American 19th century history, the Civil War. Readers of Dickinson's poetry increasingly uh, recognize and tune into the compositions that, that capture the traumas of this conflict. 
uh, one of uh, one of her this is a, one of her mentors or a mentor um, was Thomas Wentworth Higginson, a prominent abolitionist and um, commander of a black regiment in the in the Civil War. Dickinson had begun to feel an increasing need for an external preceptor to be a sounding board for her for her art, for the quality, the value of her poetry. So she turned to Thomas Wentworth Higginson, who'd published an essay in the Atlantic Magazine offering advice to young readers. As soon as Emily read the essay, she reached out to him with a, with a blunt question. Are you too deeply occupied to say if my verse is alive? And this kicked off a lifelong friendship uh, and exchange of poetry. So there's not time today, but if you'd like to explore this relationship between the Civil War and Dickinson's question to Higginson about her poetry, you, could, you should check out Martha Ackman's fine new book, These Fevered Days. By the time uh, Dickinson turned 35, she had uh, composed more than 1,100 powerful lyrics that examined from all angles, the human experience of pain and grief and joy and love and nature and art. She'd recorded about 800 of these poems in small handmade booklets now called fascicles that she is not known to have shared with anyone. So here are a variety of her manuscripts. Um, a fascicle uh, is not necessarily represented among these, but it was a, they were folded pieces of paper stacked together and stitched with, uh, stitched with a, a string. So even though uh, she wrote, uh, copied out and retained uh, these many hundreds of poems uh, as a private collection, um, on the other hand, she sent uh, several hundred poems on loose sheets to family and friends. Her closest reader was Susan Dickinson, who received more than 250 poems throughout their 40 year relationship. And these two, uh, the, the poems uh, that she shared with correspondence were for the most part held privately by their recipients. So only a handful of poems, only about 10 poems were published during Dickinson's lifetime, all of them published anonymously and apparently without her prior consent. So the vast majority of her work remained known only to its author until after uh, her death in 1886. Some events in Dickinson's life are difficult to reconstruct. Uh, drafts of three letters now called the master letters suggest a serious and troubled attachment that some believe propelled or reflected a period of intense creativity. It's not known whether Dickinson actually sent finished copies of these letters to anyone, nor do we know who this master figure might have been. On top of these unknowns are questions about the nature of Dickinson's intimate relationships, her growing reclusiveness as she aged, her adopted habit of wearing white and uh, other issues. But uh, on the subject of the master letters, if you're interested, um, see a new book, the one that Daryl mentioned earlier, published by Amherst Press. This is by Marta Werner, um, Writing in Time, Emily Dickinson's Master Hours, which puts the letter drafts in the larger context of associated poems and, um, and materials. So um, these are just a few high points of um, Dickinson's formation as a poet. So, and I'm, uh, we'll, won't have time today to, to um, discuss her, her own life more because now we're, we're, we're going to wander into the area of, uh, of biography of biography. Uh, so I'm just going to quickly mention that Dickinson's later life, um, she, she became in, increasingly reclusive. Um, she, went through the illnesses and deaths of many she held dear and um, commented on this in the last years of her life. The dyings have been too great for me. Uh, and she remained in poor health herself for the last year and a half, two years of her life until she died 
only at the age of 55 in 1886. So I said that so many of her poems um, were not necessarily shared with uh, or known uh, by others uh, and were uh, discovered by her sister Lavinia after Emily's death. Uh, within just a year or so of Dickinson's death, Lavinia recruited Mabel Loomis Todd, spouse of a, an Amherst College astronomy professor, David Peck Todd, to produce a small edition of uh, two or 300 of Emily's poems. And she was aided in this work by none other than Thomas Wentworth Higginson. Importantly, uh, Mabel Todd, as I'm sure most or all of you know, had been involved in a long-term relationship with Emily and Lavinia's brother, Austin. Um, so Mabel Todd brought out this first volume and then followed up on this uh, first compilation in, in 1890 with, uh, with two more editions of poetry, as well as a two volume edition of biography and letters. She also included, uh, she also took to the lecture circuit and included the topic Emily Dickinson on her roster of lectures available to the public. Um, other lectures she offered had to do with um, travel in foreign lands and with her uh, husband David's work as an astronomer. A rancorous lawsuit between the Todds and Lavinia Dickinson over a small plot of land Austin had intended to leave to Mabel stalled any further publication of Dickinson poems by Mabel Todd and she refused to return to the Dickinsons any of the poem manuscripts still in her possession at that time. Um, this is a, a fairly well-known story and there are really excellent accounts of the, the drama of all of this to be found in Austin and Mabel, The Amherst Affair and Love Letters of Austin Dickinson and Mabel Loomis Todd by Polly Longsworth. And more recently, uh, After Emily, Two Remarkable Women and the Legacy of America's Greatest Poet by Julie Dobro. So please keep Mabel Todd in mind because she'll reappear as I uh, change gears now into uh, the birthday story about the real Emily Dickinson, or as we'll come to see about literary body snatchers. Um, so this is about uh, the centenary of Emily Dickinson's birth. So um, 1930, so as, as, as the centenary in 1930 of Emily Dickinson's birth drew near, the world began to sit up and take more notice of this remarkable poet. Between 1929 and 1935, the public saw the release in quick succession of two new biographies from writers outside the circle of those connected with the Dickinson family. Uh, and um, a, whole, a whole slew of books from, from within that circle, including a memoir by a family friend, McGregor Jenkins, titled Emily Dickinson, Friend and Neighbor. So one of the independent biographies was by the established poet and editor, Genevieve Taggart, who wrote The Life and Mind of Emily Dickinson published while Taggart held a teaching position at Mount Holyoke College. And the other was by Josephine Pollitt, uh, who began her biography uh, as a thesis project at Columbia University. Uh, her book was Emily Dickinson, The Human Background of Her Poetry. Well, in the beginning, these two uh, had planned to work in connection with each other um, to produce these two fresh biographical ap approaches to Dickinson's poetry. So both of them tried to engage with Mabel Todd and with Martha Dickinson Bianchi, who was Emily Dickinson's niece, the daughter of her brother, Austin. Um, 
for interviews, for information, and for access to manuscripts. And uh, as uh, one scholar, Aoife Murray, has explained this, the idea was that the senior poet Taggart would help to polish the junior writer uh, Pollitt's work, and both volumes would be published in celebration of the centenary of Dickinson's birth. Well, apparently this plan broke down when their experiences with Mabel Todd and Martha Dickinson Bianchi diverged pretty significantly, significantly um, on a kind of personal level in a sense, uh, and because their interpretations of Emily Dickinson's chief romantic interest differed. Uh, one favored um, Amherst College uh, classmate of Austin Dickinson, George Gould, while the other favored uh, Major Edward Hunt, who was Helen Hunt Jackson's husband. So the main point here is that both works, uh, both books were in the genre of popular biography, but they were really the first full length independent treatments of the poet. And further along into the 1930s, there was a, a, a great biography uh, by Amherst College professor George Witcher that um, came out in 1938. But that's a little bit beyond our, uh, beyond our story today. So by far the greatest publishing activity around the centenary came from Emily's own niece, Martha Dickinson Bianchi, who still occupied the Evergreens next door to the homestead. During this relatively short period, uh, she produced four volumes of uh, uh, unknown, republished, or selected poems, as well as two works of biography and letters. Amherst College awarded her an honorary doctor of letters with a citation that um, celebrated Martha's Great grandfather, Samuel Fowler Dickinson, as a founder of the college, her grandfather Edward and father Austin as two of its treasures for a combined total of 60 years, her aunt Emily Dickinson as a rare and original spirit, and finally Martha herself as a biographer, a novelist, and a poet. Um, so all of this was wrapped up in a, a the celebration of the 100th birthday of Emily Dickinson. So um, what, what beyond the obvious significance of a 100th birthday anniversary uh, provoked this level of activity, hyperactivity almost during this period? Um, there are a number of uh, perhaps unexpected dramas around Emily Dickinson's life and legacy, and this is kind of one of them. So in the years leading up to the centenary, Bianchi sought legal advice about her literary rights to material published by Mabel Todd, but she was advised that her case was not strong. Um, she was not pleased and she was not impressed by the biographies published by Taggart or Pollitt, uh, or not even by the memoir uh, of family friend McGregor Jenkins. So her response was to go on a publishing offensive. Uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi was determined to reclaim, um, especially from Mabel Todd, um, her aunt's poetry, her bi biography, and the legacy for the Dickinson family. She wanted to shape and control the focus of, uh, shape the attitudes and control the focus of uh, Emily Dickinson's growing fan base. And just as important as one scholar has noted, the immense profits and subsequent controversies of the Dickinson revival led her to seek justification in book sales. The market, which Emily Dickinson herself had compared to an auction, uh, became for her niece a source of vindication, a means uh, uh, for avenging the wrongs and embarrassments brought to the Dickinson family by, by Mabel Todd. So in a, a bit of a swipe at other biographers who had never actually laid eyes on Emily Dickinson, 
Martha promoted her own status as the last surviving member of the family and the quote, only one who saw her face to face. Well, this was a direct reference to the fact that uh, although Mabel Todd was in and out of the homestead quite a bit, she had never actually laid eyes on, uh, on, on Emily Dickinson herself until after, after her death. Um, and just to drive home the point, Martha titled one of her biographies, Face to Face. Uh, so in addition to publishing, Martha Dickinson Bianchi likewise took to the lecture circuit between 1930 and 1932, visiting at least two dozen colleges and poetry organizations, giving a lecture titled The Real Emily Dickinson. So you can see that the title of my talk is a complete, uh, complete ripoff of, of Martha's. Um, so in this, uh, in all of this, in these, lecture, in these public lectures all around the country, Martha emphasized these five essential points. So first, she said, uh, Emily Dickinson knew the fickleness of critics and the public and chose to evade fame in her lifetime, but left open the possibility of um, a, a kind of prominent posthumous reputation. So an example, so while Emily wrote things like fame is a fickle food upon a shifting plate, or fame has a sting, but it has a wing. Martha's position, on the contrary, was what posthumous fame do angels know or care? And that's a, that's a little jotting she made on the edge of a, of a manuscript, meaning and her, her point there was um, that Emily intentionally left it up to later generations to do with her work what they would. Second, Martha was adamant uh, that known inaccuracies, especially about Emily's love life had to be corrected. So this kind of harks back to this difference of opinion between Genevieve Taggart and Josephine Pollitt about uh, you know, whether it was George Gould or uh, Major Hunt, who was, or, or uh, is uh, probably more people thought, um, the Reverend Charles Wadsworth, who, um, uh, who needed to sort of be at the kind of the romantic center of Emily Dickinson's life as they had it, you know, back in 1930. So Martha scoffed at biographers who speculated about romantic interests or even whether she would have been happier if she had married. And, you know, I think, of course, we have to expand that to would have been happier um, in any kind of partner relationship. So uh, Martha countered this, uh, saying that marriage or a relationship would never have compensated for the loss of her own identity. Um, that kind of distraction would simply have compromised the artistic compulsion, as she put it, and the inquisitive Afri uh, sorry, the inquisitive apprehension that made her who she was. Third, and this is a little, a little odd to me, a little peculiar, was Bianchi's argument that people of the 1930s simply couldn't imagine the context of uh, the material context of Dickinson's life 50 years earlier. The transition to the modern world, I mean, even in terms of transportation and communication and conveniences was so dramatic that Dickinson's time and her imagination were out of reach of modern readers of the 1930s. Um, you know, she admitted that the Dickinson family homes and the objects saved at the Evergreens reduced the distance between Dickinson's mind and that of the modern reader, but it didn't completely close the gap. Um, I think one reason I find this argument so curious is that, you know, at the time she was writing this, Bianchi herself was in her mid 60s and she uh, was claiming, of course, a full connection with her aunt and her aunt's time. Fourth, and uh, most, probably most problematic or most significant was um, 
the problem of biography. So here I'm going to quote Martha Dickinson Bianchi several times or at length, uh, because this was a real source of outrage to her. I mean, she was highly critical of biographies who had uh, biographers who had never known her aunt, but were now, um, this quote, announcing their own arrival at the secret springs of Emily Dickinson's being. Particularly at fault uh, were those who, you know, brought preconceived theories to Dickinson's unknowable interior life. Uh, and so here's a, a kind of a lengthy quote. In this age of melodramatic biography, none of the great dead are safe from literary body snatchers. Every detail is copy. No detail is amiss. Your chances are better to take it standing while you can still pick out your own past. Lest in the pseudo psychological jargon of our day, you be convicted of some undreamed obsession. There are those who plate her, explain her, expose her, shall we hesitate to say, exploit her? So um, I just wanna sort of call attention to this manuscript here on the, on the left. Um, Martha Dickinson Bianchi had a, uh, you know, she had a, an individual kind of handwriting, but even here you can see that uh, this is really forceful. It's practically screaming at us off the page and every other word is underlined in, in red. Um, this is uh, the, um, a little bit, but you can see what she's saying on, on the right. And I think, you know, she, she um, was, was very concerned about psychological interpretations of Emily Dickinson, um, which you can see here, um, psychologizing a psychic urge, a complex you never suspected. The fact that you wouldn't eat crusts accounts for God knows what, uh, uh, for your, for your um, work and your reputation and your legacy. So fifth in her arguments, and finally, Bianchi insisted um, to deduce her, explain her, dissolve, diffuse her essence, any may try, all must fail. She remains a secret. Emily is part of the chemistry of God. So certainly, uh, Bianchi wanted to place Emily Dickinson above the reach of fame and beyond the grasp of the knowable. At the same time, though, uh, Bianchi couldn't help but tease her readers with the idea that, quote, Emily's opinion of her own posthumous fame would be electrical reading, as if she knew what that private opinion was. Well, she probably didn't. And while claiming to describe her aunt's life vividly and in detail, Bianchi ultimately fell back to the position that she remains a secret. Emily is part of the chemistry of God. So let's uh, fast forward a little bit to um, fast forward another 90 years to this 191st birthday um, with the question, you know, who is Emily Dickinson today? Her poetry and her life story are probably more popular and widely read and now viewed than ever. Uh, and during this pandemic, Emily's work uh, has become more real and immediate to many readers uh, because of its connection to the poet's lived experience of solitude and, and our own need to make meaning of the fragmented parts of the world around us. During these past 18 months, two years now, uh, there have been so many opinion pieces and essays looking to Emily Dickinson as an example of uh, many things, perseverance, courage, adaptation, um, inner resources, grit, hope, other qualities. So that's one Emily Dickinson today. But even before the pandemic, Emily Dickinson had finally made it to the big screen 
And that's another Emily Dickinson, not so much as a as biography, but as um, a, a representative of sorts. Um, so one of these was A Quiet Passion. This was came out in 2016. Um, I don't know if you saw it, but it had a great cast, beautiful cinematography, uh, but it was kind of slow moving and had a kind of flat script. Um, its focus was an overriding struggle against religious orthodoxy uh, and a struggle with fulfillment as a poet. Uh, soon after that, the comedy tragedy Wild Nights with Emily Dickinson, starring the Saturday Night Live uh, standout Molly Shannon. And this film had uh, a couple of central themes. Um, a queer relationship between Emily and Susan, and Emily's ambition to have her poetry published. And a third lens worth mentioning um, in this film, I think, is Mabel Todd's um, uh, appropriation of Emily's poetry and biography after her death. Uh, the more recent Apple TV show has pushed a uh, contemporary interpretation of particular Dickinson characteristics to a new level. And in this iteration, um, uh, Emily is cast as um, rebellious, queer, determined, vulnerable, powerful, um, all of these and more. The sets and costumes are amazing um, and reproduced as authentically as possible, while the scripts, the themes, and the contemporary overlay speak more directly to new generations of Dickinson readers. This Emily Dickinson is a force of nature, exploring what it takes to assert an artistic identity and how that individual must, must then cope with the advantages and disappointments of anonymity versus the satisfaction and risks of fame. Um, there are many other uh, genres of popular portrayal uh, of Dickinson. And one that I kind of enjoy is um, uh, spoof cartoons that spoof the older and kind of tired portrayals of Dickinson as timid, imprisoned, and only ethereal. Uh, and they're kind of fun for their absurdist perspective. And um, it, this, this little cartoon, I think, you know, with it, with its um, abbreviated um, social media references, um, you know, you can kind of dig into the the hashtags and the likes and and um, um, find the fun references that make this uh, make this uh, kind of amusing and, and attractive. Um, Notes that Dickinson, the Apple TV show, invites us to accept that the poet has long been whatever her audience makes of her or needs her to be. Um, and I think that's kind of an important point. Um, Mabel Todd did some polishing of Dickinson's poetry to suit a late 19th century audience, and she published. Dickinson letters to respond to the audience interest in just who this poet was. It was um, kind of a clamoring for understanding where the poetry came from. Um, those early biographers tended to look for new angles on just who this poet was, how this poetry could come to be. Martha Dickinson Bianchi wanted, on the other hand, to erase speculation about Emily's life, while, on the other hand, that insisting that she remained a secret. Movie or television representations of Dickinson have to be selective rather than comprehensive in the aspects of her life and character that they emphasize. Um, Uh, at the Emily Dickinson Museum, we see uh, a very wide range of visitors coming to the homestead with 
intensely personal connections with their, their own Emily Dickinsons. With my um, I'm, I'm sorry, Jane, I just wanted to let you know we're getting some feedback, I think, when you wrestle your paper, possibly you're wrestling your papers on the laptop, just wanted to give you thank that you. heads up. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you. So I just want to say a couple more things about the role of biography and context at, um, at the writer's home. Um, you know, people who come here come in search of a poet whose work, and in some cases her life story, has spoken that to them fairly profoundly uh, and personally um, for their own, uh, you know, multiple reasons. Um, visitors are often intellectually or emotionally devoted to Dickinson's poetry and to the poet herself and to those who make their way off the beaten path to, you know, what is still kind of semi-rural Amherst. The importance of place is indisputable. So to some, her home uh, represents a, a physical touchstone to Emily Dickinson, the poet. To others, it's, um, it's a vessel, a vessel that's imbued with the remnants of a, her creative power to inspire. And to still others, it's a dwelling that um, continues to hold traces of the lived experience of an artist who overcame certain challenges uh, and succumbed to others to pursue her chosen vocation. Above all, Dickinson's home and her story seem to give the visitors a way to touch, um, physically touch, the elusive secret of her originality. Um, and, uh, you know, it, so we have a, at the Emily Dickinson Museum, sort of a particular role. Um, so this question arises to, I mean, comes up for me, how do preservation and restoration play off of biography and poetry? And almost by definition, the museum's job is to preserve and share the specific context of the life of a poet uh, who was entirely unique uh, and her distinctive work. Well, here at the homestead, not very long ago, really, only you know, within the last 20 years, it was thought almost impossible to recreate any semblance of Dickinson's home as she knew it. But really fairly steadily over the last 20 years, um, the, the uh, sort of physical investigation of, of the house has made a reasonably authentic restoration possible. And today we're able to replace the 20th century rather neutral surroundings that reinforce old notions of Emily Dickinson as a kind of isolated incorporeal versifier with the much livelier and more textured environment known in her own time. So I can show you a few examples of what we've already done and where we're headed in this current restoration that will take us into spring uh, of next year, spring 2022. Um, so the, what you just saw, the homestead in uh, red brick and white was a 20th century version of the homestead. Uh, and about 15 years ago, um, we restored the exterior uh, so that it would appear as it did uh, through very specific kinds of paint analysis and other techniques uh, to appear uh, as it did when Dickinson lived here in the 1870s and 80s. Um, other projects have been taking Emily Dickinson's own room, um, which you can see is fairly um, plain spare and um, researching uh, how it was furnished and how it was decorated to um, move from uh, plain to uh, a, a much more um, sort of textured and lively and livable um, uh, room. Another example is the library and the homestead that again had sort of been stripped of its 19th century um, atmosphere. 
and moving that back toward um, how it looked in uh, the 20th, uh, in the 19th century. Um, the conservatory is another example. So on the, on the left is an image of the conservatory as it was in say 1915, 1916. Um, it was absent for a hundred years and then uh, restored with its actual architectural parts, its actual component parts um, just a few years ago. Um, in the current restoration, this is just a list of um, what we are uh, trying to address in, uh, in this current restoration, which is essentially the main block of the house that her grandfather built in 1813. Um, some of the things that help this restoration are finding materials that have been hidden away for more than a hundred years. Um, here we're seeing uh, the balusters for the original 1855 staircase that were stored up and away uh, in the homestead garage. Um, here, where we've rescued the 19th century front door uh, and are restoring that door. Um, what's so interesting to me is that um, these parts and pieces, you know, you can see on the right that the etched glass is only, there are only fragments left. Um, in the center is um, evidence of a nameplate. And on the left is um, kind of 1870s, 80s, Eastlake style lock plate. Um, on the on the right is a 1916 photograph of that front entry before it was changed by the family that lived there in the 20th century. Well, being able to zoom in on that photograph, um, our architects have been able to reproduce precisely the full pattern of the etched glass for that front door. So it's, um, we're finding interesting ways to, um, to recover information and reassess. Um, the homestead had put down inside um, modern floorboards in the 20th century, but the 19th century floorboards lie directly beneath them. Um, so the modern floorboards will come up, hopefully revealing more evidence of how the house was um, uh, decorated or um, lost information uh, that we can recover. Uh, this photograph is trying to demonstrate, it's a little hard to see, that, uh, that, the, uh, we, that we can figure out um, the, the um, size and shape of the original newel post and the new, that newel post no longer exists, but um, now we're um, finding ways uh, with uh, ghost marks on the floor um, to understand what its original design was. Another uh, really interesting um, project, a project of its own in all of this is um, finding uh, remnants of wallpaper from past years from the 19th century and being able to um, find fragments from different, different places on the wall and rebuild the pattern so that we can reduce the, uh, reproduce that wallpaper and put it back in place with this restoration. Um, there are still ghosts of the past um, by removing some of the sort of decorative additions. Um, we can still find earlier paint treatments and earlier, uh, earlier building materials beneath what uh, the 20th century coverings over those historic materials. Um, Jane, I just, I just want to, I'm sorry to interrupt. I just want to let you know, it's just about 530. We have just about a minute left. Um, okay. Okay. And I'm really right at the, I'm really right at the end here. Um, so these are, again, this is just evidence of what we have from 
the past and what we're able to uh, put back together with um, documentary evidence and um, forensic evidence. And so that's, um, you know, I, uh, we get to talk about who Emily Dickinson was at the Dickinson Museum and um, to explore those ideas, both through her life, her environment uh, and her poetry. Um, you know, there are gonna be things about Emily Dickinson that are, that are just gonna remain unknowable. Um, and these are, these are interesting questions for us. Um, can we know the real Emily Dickinson? And does it matter? So what do you think? Thank you so much, uh, Jane. That was really a wonderful presentation and um, uh, the, all the different facets. There are lots of uh, questions coming in, lots of comments and lively discussions going on. Um, Brooke, what do you think? I know we're right at 5.30. Do, do you wanna take maybe one question? Or yeah, should... Daryl, if you think you've got time for one or two questions, I think that would be wonderful. And we thank you so much everybody for your comments. I'm really I'm enjoying Jane. Some folks are responding to your, your questions back and um, we'll be sure to take some time with this wonderful chat after this too, to review it for us. Right. Well, let's just do one. So uh, folks who have to, have to leave, uh, you know, can do so. Um, uh, here's uh, one recent one from Erica Martinson. Has anything you've uncovered changed anything previously restored, Jane? Um, no, uh, not so far, but um, things that we have uncovered uh, are changing what we think of um, some of the adaptations that we we thought had been static in say from uh, from the 1860s through the 1880s or 90s. Um, now we're think we are wondering um, if there were more episodes of change. Uh, in decor or, you know, equipment, um, domestic equipment. Um, so we're we're finding out new things that I that will continue to impact future restoration projects that we didn't know about before. Thanks, and um, let, let's do one more. Um, Let's see, this one, uh, did Mar Martha Bianchi's poetry share qualities with Dickinson? Absolutely not. They were uh, extremely different stylists um, where Emily's poetry was concise and um, uh, packed. Uh, and required some, you know, some some effort to go from concrete to abstract and back again. Uh, Martha Dickinson Bianchi's style was kind of romantic and flowing, and um, very much, very much a part. Very, uh, I'll put it this way. Martha Dickinson Bianchi's uh, poetry was um, as rooted in its own time and style as Emily Dickinson's poetry is timeless and um, accessible to uh, to all to all ages, all periods. All right. Well, with that, um, uh, I think we'll we'll stop and. Let people get on with their evenings or late night activities uh, in some parts of the world where people are joining us from. And, uh, and I want to thank you again on behalf of the Center for Humanistic Inquiry. Uh, thank you, Brooke. 
uh, for bringing this wonderful program and sharing it with us. Um, uh, looking forward to visiting you again in at the museum uh, as, as soon as that's possible. Right. Thank Thanks you. very much, Daryl. Thank you, Jane. I love this last one last comment that I'll just share, which I think uh, one of our audience members said, I think Emily Dickinson would enjoy the speculation around the mystery she left us and appreciate how much her poetry means to so many. And uh, I, I fully agree with that, Esther, and, and we certainly appreciate all of you for being here. Very so. true. Have a wonderful evening, everyone. We'll continue to be bringing you more birthday celebrations this month. We hope you'll keep in touch with us. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Jane. Good night, everyone.